our brother Jamie was met with a situation very untimely and uh, where his mother was uh, passed away unexpectedly and he had to fly out to California and uh, a lot of things were happening in a very little time. He didn't know what he was going to do and, and uh, how he was going to meet the call. And um, he turned to the source that he could always rely on and that's God. And, um, and then he reached out to a brother and sister and Peggy and Marcel and uh, they approached me and, uh, that uh, afternoon and shared with me what was going on. And, and as you know, later that evening, that Saturday night, I shared with you that maybe we could chip in and help out. And, um, and uh, boy, you guys responded so beautifully. It touched uh, Jamie's heart in a way that is very, very unique. And he asked if he could spend a few minutes, and I told him I'd give him a couple hours. Uh, in, the, in, in about 15 to 20 minutes that he'd like to just talk to you and share what happened and uh, in more ways than one. So Jamie, if you'd like to come on up and uh, share your story. Can everyone hear me now? Okay. Yes. Um, first, I'd just like to thank everyone as my brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, I didn't ask for any financial help, but thank you for donating coming together for me. Every bit helped me a lot tremendously. And um, yeah, and also your prayers. Trust me, your, your prayers and your thoughts and your comments, they weren't taken lightly. I needed every bit of inspiration and every bit of encouragement and prayer along the way. It wasn't just about finances, honestly. I needed as much support as I could get. And um, so, I'm going to tell you uh, why it was so significant, besides my mom passing, the situation. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to tell you what happened first, and then I'm going to go into my childhood leading up to it. Uh, I haven't seen my mom in 24 years. I didn't know if my mom was alive or dead. We've tried to search for my mom. Um, we could not find her. She made it to where she did not want to be found. She had no bills in her name. She wasn't collecting Social Security. She had uh, no credit cards, nothing in her name. She did not want to be found. So I was left with a void for the last 24 years, wondering, is my mom alive or dead? And it, uh, it's not a good feeling to not know who would your parent, if you, you know, that you love so much still, um, where they are. So, <clears throat> last week I just got a letter from the uh, corn um, treasurer of the deceased office of Los Angeles and was reaching out to family members of that name. Um, well, first it was started off on a bad note with us because on, the, on the, the letter it said Anna Levinsky. Well, that's actually my father's wife's name now. So it doesn't look good saying the deceased who's still alive. So I was already a little bit of emotion, uh, emotional and we didn't get off on a good start me and the, the, tre <clears throat> the treasurer. Long story short, after she finally said that I meant you know, I apologize, I meant to say Anita Levinsky. You know, I, I didn't want to believe it at first, and then I accepted it. And, um, so, in one paragraph, you're told, we found your mom, she's dead, how would you like to go with the proceedings, all in basically one paragraph. It's a lot to take in at once. I'm still trying to get past the I found we found your mom part, let alone the deceased and proceedings. So I was stunned, shocked, everything you could probably imagine. Um, my brother and I, I, I just said, look, I don't know what I'm doing, but I have to go up there for for our mom. Um, I don't know what we're going to be doing, if it's a funeral or cremation.
inflammation, whatever the cause is, but I need to go up there. So there was many people along the way who tried to persuade me not to go. And um, the reason being is uh, I was told that my mom passed actually a month ago. So she was actually in whatever you want to say, the morgue refrigerator, however you want to say it. And uh, the treasurer was saying, you have no need to go, try to convince my father, there's no need to go. But my brother and I knew I needed to go. I don't care if, I didn't know what condition she was going to be in. I didn't know if she was missing limbs, half her face gone. I didn't care, I needed to go and see my mom one last time. Um, I spent 24 years looking for her. So, against family members' will, I went. I went on my own. Um, I took a flight Monday to LA. And it seems like the enemy just kept trying to work from there. Because as soon as I got there, the, the, the place where my, my brother was setting me up to stay, a family friend, I get there and I say, okay, um, can you give me your address? I'm ready to go. And they're like, and uh, the female uh, family friend said, oh, well, I don't know, if, I don't know if you, uh, your brother told you or not, but uh, I, I can't let you stay here because I'm, I'm staying with um, I'm a roommate situation. He doesn't want anyone else here, and I'm like, okay, I wasn't told this. So basically, I was out of out of luck and out of sync for a little while. I spent two to three hours trying to figure out where I was going to stay in a hotel. And I eventually find, found a place a little bit off the beaten path. It was a little bit affordable. No, it was very, very affordable. And I was just thankful God helped me um, find it. Uh, in addition to that, um, I kept trying to uh, set up an appointment to see my mom. I kept getting to run around, nobody would tell me why. Uh, the medical facility, um, they would not tell me why. And then eventually spoke to my brother. And he had to relay the information to me and saying they did not want to be responsible for me seeing my mom the way she was, I guess, deteriorated, this and that. And I said, but I had talked to my brother and I said, look, I'm not expecting my mom to look peachy and rosy, but that's my mom regardless of how she looks now. It's still my mom and I need to see her. I need to just see her one more time, deceased or not. So then we, after that, we, uh, I had to go through so, much, uh, so many phone calls of trying to get a um, crematorium we decided it was the most financial sound thing that we could do. Um, I eventually found a place. They set it up. Um, they said that they'd allow me to have my time with my mom before they uh, cremated her. But unfortunately, one thing is, it's not like a funeral parlor where they, a uh, normal situation where they doll the person up and make up and prep and all that. I basically got my mom still in the bag, but just with a sheet over her. But again, I didn't care. I, I needed to see my mom, regardless of how she looked. And um, so I, every day I was posting something different. Part of it was because I was scared and I was venting. Another thing is I know a lot of people were supporting me and, and were on my side and I wanted you to somewhat be a part of the journey with me to understand where I was going each time, what I was doing. So eventually I, I, the day came, I seen my mom, it was Thursday and uh, at first it was a, a it, it was a hard sight to um, to uh, grasp uh, just the condition she was in. 
but after I got past that, I just knew in my mind, I'm like, she's still my mom, and I love her. And I just prayed with her, and I told her all the things that I wanted to know, because as Christians, I know, <clears throat> we all know, that we're more than just a, a shell. We're more than just flesh and blood. And I don't care what anyone told to me, talked to me, and, and would say to me, me and my brother knew that if I was there, I tr we truly believed that my mom spiritually was going to be there listening to everything that we had to, that I had to say. I think she wanted closure too. So in spirit form, I think she truly was there. Um, I told her I love her, I forgive her. Uh, I said all the things that I wanted to. I told my brother, I told her my brother forgives her and loves her and we know that she wasn't in her right mind to, to leave the way she did 24 years ago. Um, and we just forgive her and, uh, you know, I, I hugged her deceased body. I, I didn't care. Um, I pat her head, I, I kissed her forehead, I said, I love you, mommy. And um, it was a release in me. It was not how I wanted to see my mom, but it was the fact that I got to see my mom. And um, I, I, can't, I can't thank God enough, first and foremost, because without Him, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have a lot of things. I wouldn't have a church. I wouldn't have my brothers and sisters and you guys, just to be here, my friends. Um, I wouldn't have had um, probably the courage to do what I had to do. Um, so after that, I went and I actually called um, and I, I found out the place that she was staying at for the last eight to nine years. It was an assisted living home. And uh, they couldn't tell me everything of the last 24 years. I just knew. They were able to tell me my mom was homeless for a little while. I don't know how she got like that, but um, for at least the eight, last eight, nine years, she, um, she was in a good, good home. And I said, look, I'm about 35 miles away from you. Um, may I be honored to come and personally thank you all for caring for my mom the way you did. And they said, sure. And, um, so I, I went over there and I, I uh, this, this lady who runs the facility, it's called Golden State Manor. Um, her name is Miss Annie. Um, she's, she's a Catholic, but you know, of course she's a believer. And um, she said that the only way she'd be able to run this whole place, the way she does is because of her faith in God. And, um, she, she told me that my mom was one of the nicest, sweetest persons, and she said that she was never a problem, and um, that because of the situation she was in, she, she didn't have um, Social Security. So she, um, out of their own money for the last eight to nine years, they would provide for my mom, like little, whatever it is, um, clothing or basic um, amenities, needs. Mm -hmm. I started breaking down and crying. And I said, I can't thank you enough for just your gen generosity and loving and caring and no one asked you to do any of that, but thank you. Um, I, it just feels good to know my mom was in good hands and love. Um, we prayed together. Thanked every one of the staff members that, that helped my mom, and um, I try to buy them, uh, you know, lunch just to show my gratitude, even the simplest form of gratitude. And she said no. She said, uh, the lady Miss Annie said, I don't want your, we don't want your money, and um, we would do this all over again. And actually, she said my mom was a special case because of the fact she didn't have Social Security. She helped open um, a program um, with her case. Being in her case, she helped 
open uh, the doors of a program to let other people in her situation be helped who went on Social Security. Um, an ironic thing is, uh, they spent like the last eight, nine years trying to gather information on my mom. If she was a citizen or not, she finally got approved for Social Security. Ironically, uh, four to six weeks before she died. Um, but I'm just grateful. Um, to backtrack a little bit, I want to spend a little bit of um, the time of uh, saying my story and how it even got to that point. Um, I was adopted from the age of uh, birth. My, my father is Jewish, my mother is Filipino, who just, who just passed. Uh, I have a brother, and uh, she, um, how we got adopted is because my mom, uh, she was carrying twins at one point, and her body didn't take to it, so basically she couldn't have kids, and my father and my mom a lot, uh, elected to adopt, and they wanted to have kids, so that's how my brother and I came about. Um, my, mom, my mom was very loving, very caring. She was very educated. She was a, a teacher in the Philippines. Um, let's see. So, I think one day in like, what was 87 or 88, my mom, for whatever reason, I'm just kind of moving it along. Um, she she was addicted to gambling, in particular playing bingo. Why bingo? I don't usually hear people addicted to bingo, but it's a form of gambling. And for whatever reason, it was a real it was a real disease, and she was hooked because she went every night. And there was one particular night where my it was almost like a like watching a, a movie, literally. Uh, it was storming. My, my father told her not to go out, that he felt something bad was going to happen. So as a child, I got, I said, oh crap, I, I think, I'm like, man, I don't want nothing to happen to my mom. So I took her keys and I hid them. And for whatever reason, I still don't know why to this day, but she was looking everywhere and she came to me and she, and this like intense look and she, she, she picked me up, and she's, she, uh, see, she was four foot eleven. She picked me up, uh, even as a kid, and said, Jamie, where's my keys? And I got scared, and at that moment I had a decision. I could, I could lie and say, I don't know, or I could give it to her. For whatever reason, I decided to give her the keys. And that was... One decision I, I, I wish I could take back in life. Uh, that night around 12 a.m., my mom was uh, hit by a drunk driver. She was almost killed. She was in a coma. Her head was split open, 40-something stitches, whatever. When she came out of the coma, she was never the same mentally. She wasn't uh, retarded or mentally challenged like that, but just something was off. You could tell when someone has a brain injury, they don't talk like everything's together. And uh, eventually she just started acting different and wanted a divorce from my father and even told my father she didn't want to raise kids no more. And uh, so after they got divorced, I still seen my mom and everything. And uh, you know, every other weekend, um, and just one particular day, because she lived in Las Olas at the time. So one particular day, I went to call, like every other weekend, ready to come over. And phone was disconnected. We went over. There was nothing. There was nothing there. She moved out. Within the within the same week, I got a letter saying, you know, I, I love you very much, but just know that I have to go. Um, I need to do. I need to get away from Florida and make a change in my life. Um, uh, I need to figure some things out and uh, just know that mommy always loves you. And, 
and it's not your fault, and she sent me some money, and that was the last time I seen her in 1990. And I can tell you, it was one of the most unnerving times of my life. You gotta remember to back up the situation. I, um, I basically was given up at birth by one mom. Now another mom has left my life. I felt there was something wrong with me. I'm like, why did two moms give me up? And then I, I would say to, to God, God, if you're there, why did you allow this to happen? I, I became a toxic person, uh, bad, I vented, I rebelled, everything else you could think of. I, I just try to figure out why. Why did this happen to me? Normally when someone's adopted, they don't lose both parents. I mean, you don't lose both your adopted parents like that. I couldn't figure that. I thought there was something wrong with me. Why? So I spent a lot of time trying to vent out and um, just find myself in the world. Um, along the way, uh, there was where I lived. There was a um, uh, Jamaican friend of mine who worked there, and his name was Richard. I eventually called him Uncle Richard. He he knew he seen that I hung out with him a lot, and um, he knew my my father's situation. So he and his wife, who I call Auntie June. So they became like my adopted family. They helped raise me in addition to my, my dad, because he had to work a lot, and I was just up there to take care of myself. So that's how my Jamaican culture of my life came about, because he taught me about everything from music to culture to cooking to working to, they, they actually raised me as if I was growing up in Jamaica, just. Here. They didn't want me to get too Americanized and spoiled, and so they instilled values. When I was in high school, in about 1992, uh, one of my friends also, he um, he was from Trinidad, and he became my best friend. So I didn't re I didn't have a relationship with God, but he shared he he started inviting me to Bible study and. Um, so you know, I, I went along with it, and, and then I and then I started to really be um, receptive of it. And just one day, I, uh, I I gave my life to Christ, and I'm like, it, it, like it, everything just started to feel good. Like I didn't have all the answers I was looking for, but I found something that gave me peace in my life. So. Um, from there, I just became a Christian. You know, I made a lot of mistakes too as a teenager. I don't even want to go into them, but uh, let alone that, I still had a relationship in Christ, and um, I slowly grew. Um, part of the reason I can relate to Brandon Marshall is um, I've always been a hyperactive person all my life. You know, and sometimes when I talk, I can get really wordy. So when I was having trouble in my, I eventually got married in 2005, and when I had <coughs> troubles in my um, relationship with my wife at the time, uh, I guess it wasn't a good combination. She was a, a nurse, and we went to counseling. So both of them combined, uh, kind of diagnosed me on their own. And they said I was um, bipolar, and I'm like, like, I went along with it for like three years. I was on whatever kind of drugs they had me on, and um, even my sister, she's a nurse. She's like, Jamie, I'll be honest. I know you're hyperactive, but I don't think you're bipolar. Like, I sh I think you should get a second opinion of being diagnosed. So I went to my family medical doctor, who, um, well, he's a, he's a doctor, he's a pill pusher, you know, he'll give pills in a heartbeat. He looked and 
he looked at the di at the, the pills I was on, and he looked at me, looked down, looked at me again, and he said, do you know what kind of pills? He was like, what are you taking these pills for? And I said, well, I'm hyperactive, and this and that. And, and uh, it said that I suffered from depression, and I, you know, I'm, my attitudes went up and down, and I'm like, which it didn't, but again, I'm just going along with what was told to me. And he said, you need to get off this stuff now. He was like, you know that they prescribe this stuff to um, people in, in uh, psychiatric hospitals? And I'm like, he was like, who, died, who, who gave you these things? And I told him, it was a counselor, I'll try to hurry it up. So I told him what happened, and he was like, no. He was like, you need to get off this. He was, you're a healthy young man, start exercising, eating. So I didn't want to live to a stigma. I didn't want to be this thing called bipolar. I'm like, is that what I want to be labeled as? Is that what someone else told me who I am? What does Christ tell me who I am? So I started exercising, eating right, living right, and I was a healthy human being. And I, I've been, I haven't been on medication for 10 years, and I'm not suicidal. I'm not bouncing off the walls. I'm normal like any human being, like meaning, if you told me the lottery today, I'm going to be happy. And then in five seconds later, if you told me someone died, I'm going to be sad. That's normal. That's normal. So, um, yeah, stigmas. So don't live, don't live by stigmas and don't live by what people tell you who you are. Who does Christ tell you who you are? I mean, who does Christ say you are is the main thing. And um, so, yeah, so then going through life after divorce, I wound up in CBG, found a wonderful Bible study. Um, and I still hoped and prayed one day I'd find my mom. And then um, that's what brings me to uh, recently, you know, out of the blue. Um, so, sorry if I was a little long-winded. Sorry, you know, if I took a little bit of time. As my family, I wanted to know how I could repay you. Not financially, but what I can do to, to show my gratitude. And I wanted to share my story about my life and why my mom's death was so meaningful, as well as seeing my mom again, why it was so meaningful. So, like my brother said to me, none of those people who said to go, who, who, who said not to see mommy, he said they don't have an emotional attachment. He was like, you needed to do this. You needed to have closure. And he said, I'm proud of you. And I said, thank you. So, I end this and I say thank you for being my family. I love you guys. And uh, I can't thank you enough. Serious. But, uh, that's not easy to share a story like that, Jamie. It takes a lot of guts, it takes a lot of courage, and uh, we love you, brother. And. Uh... Uh, okay.